Snap Studios. When the days start to grow shorter, when a chill grips the evening air, when the moon stays low over the horizon, only then may our ritual begin. Friday, the 13th of September, it is rising. Snap Nation, our evil twin podcast spook proudly presents Season of the Wolf. Eight brand new spook episodes back to back to back until Halloween and the thin veil between the living and the fallen is torn asunder. Season of the Wolf on every platform, in every shadow. Be afraid and never, ever turn out the lights. Step Judgment is brought to you by Progressive, where customers who save by switching their home and car save nearly $800 on average. Quote at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. One of my favorite places is near the California coast, an old redwood grove forest. If you've never been, it's kind of hard to describe. Damp, misty, lush, verdant, the last remnants of an Eden. And redwoods, these giant ancient trees, they often grow next to each other in a protective circle around the remains around the altar of a fallen mother tree. They call this configuration a fairy ring. And if you step into the middle of this circle and you look up, it feels holy. It feels sacred. It feels wild. This cathedral, grown to protect the sacrifice of the mother. We should all be so lucky to step into the circle. Spook starts. stories from his grandfather, a member of the Ojibwe Chippewa Nation. His grandfather taught him to love and to respect nature, and that's why when Nate was 16, 
He'd often explore the forest in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. But some things, maybe nature has left alone. I believe it was around May in 1988. I called my friend, Keith, and said, what are you up to today? And he said, not too much. We're talking about a plan for the day and we should get together. And we said, well, we could go back to Diamond Hill and maybe see if we can't dig up more quartz crystals. Quartz crystals, garnets, tourmalines. When you unearth something like that, and realize that you're the first person to ever lay eyes on this thing since it started forming thousands of years ago. It's just a really fun thing to do. So we made a plan to get together and said, yeah, we'll spend the day down there. And if, if it gets to be evening, maybe we'll camp out and spend the night in the forest. I packed a screwdriver for digging, a little hand trowel for digging, some snacks, a sandwich, couple bottles of water, no sleeping bag, no gear, no nothing. We kind of let life take its course, and that was the whole point of the adventure. So I hitchhiked from Walpole, Massachusetts to meet Keith in Norfolk. We hitchhiked together. We were kind of hippies. We both had long hair and were diehard fans of a band called The Grateful Dead. We traveled all over the country, seeing them in all over the United States and a few times in Canada. So hitchhiking was just no big deal and a way to get from point A to point B. So midday, we arrive at the state park. Diamond Hill used to have a ski hill there and a chairlift, and all those items had been defunct for many years, but the hill was still there, and it was a very steep slope. This was a copper or a silver mine back in the 1800s, I believe. It was a nice sunny day, late spring. There's pine trees and deciduous trees. There were birds of prey circling over there. It was just a peaceful place. We get to the top of the hill, get out a digging spade, and we start to poke and prod down into the earth, carefully hunt for crystals. We're finding the usual milky quartz, like not super clear, they're young, like somewhat undeveloped crystals, but that's what you find at Diamond Hill. And that was good enough for us. We're happy, having a nice time, talking, and we were there until the sun started to set. We said, okay, well, let's wrap up the crystal digging and find a nice place where we're going to camp for the night. There were these roads that led between these two hills, creating a nice enclosed spot. We gathered firewood. There was a larger rock close to the fire pit. Keith sat down with his back to one side of that big stone, and I sat on the other side of it with my back to it. We were eating sandwiches and drinking our water. And even though we were wild kids, we weren't like drinking alcohol or taking any kind of substance or drugs. We had a pack of cigarettes and smoked some cigarettes, but that was literally it. It's totally dark out now. We've got a small fire started. We were just enjoying the quiet, enjoying the sound of the wind in the trees, enjoying the sounds of the animals making their calls. Suddenly we hear the fluttering of wings overhead. Like something in flight, maybe 12 to 18 feet overhead in the branches of the trees. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this noise? So I look up, 
into the trees to try to get a glimpse of whatever's wings I'm hearing beating up there. And as soon as I look up, the noise goes silent and the movement stops. Suddenly, right behind me, I hear yet another creature or something making the same fluttering a wing sound. I didn't see feathers. I didn't see a beak or eyes. I just saw that something was moving up there in the trees. And it stayed out of sight. And I said to my friend, I'm like, Keith, do you hear that? He's like, yeah, up in the trees. And I said, yes, it sounds like wings beating. It sounds like there's a bird landing up there or something. And he said, it might be an owl. I don't know. I'm turning my head back and forth, looking up into the trees, when suddenly from behind me, I hear what sounds like the rustling of feet in the leaves on the forest floor. And it sounds like it's charging us. And I look over in that direction, and the rustling sound stops. At this point, I'm starting to say this is not normal animal behavior. They seemed overly loud. Animals are quiet. Animals know how to be so quiet. If they want to sneak up on you, you'll never know they're there. This was intentional, deliberate. Something was making a presence of itself and making it known. And I'm starting to feel a little uncomfortable. All of a sudden, I realize there's something standing about 25 feet away. It was a silhouette of what looked like a human being, human-shaped head. It's hiding behind a tree. Its head is leaned out from behind the tree, and its eyes have a light in them that does not look like it's reflecting the light of our fire. These eyes literally appear to be glowing red. When I see this, a whole new level of fear takes over, and I don't know what I'm looking at. I said, Keith, there's somebody over here. I'm like, Keith, and he's not responding. I'm like, Keith. I reached behind me without taking my eyes off what I was looking at, and I grabbed his shoulder and shook him. And when he didn't respond to that, I turned around and looked, and his eyes are plastered wide open. His head is pointed up into the trees where this whole commotion had started. His mouth is a gap, just like jaw wide open and I'm like Keith and he's not responding and I really was scared now I turn around to where this person had been standing I can't see it anymore but I could see the silhouette of something kind of hidden there behind that tree suddenly This weird, weird sensation came over me. My eyelids started to get unnaturally heavy, and it felt like somebody was putting a blanket over me, like a real heavy, cold, wet blanket made of concrete. I'm fighting, I'm fighting to stay awake, and it's just like there's something outside of me pulling my eyes closed. It was bizarre. And then I hear this strange sound. It sounded like if you could hear the tectonic plates down in the earth rubbing against each other as they moved. Just really crazy, deep sound, deeper than any human voice could ever make. It's in my head, like hearing yourself think. And it started off all low and grumbly like that, but then it started to gain in volume and gain in pitch. Until the pitch got so high that it was like... (gasps) I 
I open my eyes. I'm right in the same spot. My back is against that stone. This thing, the silhouette, was out from behind the tree, and it looked like it had come down the hill maybe two feet. And it instantly backed up and got behind the tree again, as if it didn't want me to really see it. Its head was sticking out from behind the tree, and it looked to me like it squinted. That glowing, circular look of its eyes got narrower, as if it was either making angry eyes or concentrating on me. I feel terrified. Like I'm going to die out here tonight. Like there was no doubt in my mind that thing meant to do harm to me. I don't know what, but the feeling I got was it was going to take a piece of me. As soon as it squinted like that, I felt that sensation of being pushed into a sleep again. I'm trying to keep my eyes open, but I'm losing the fight. I start to hear that grumbling sound again. It got so high in pitch this time that it felt like if I didn't open my eyes, my head would have popped. It was like the worst thing that could ever happen is about to happen. And there's nothing you can do about it except try to stay awake. When I open my eyes, the sound stops. I see the silhouette. This thing is 10 feet down the hill. It flinched like somebody does when they're surprised. Like it seemed really, really surprised that I woke up. And it stared at me for a split second and then it started to back up the hill. It stayed facing me and that's when I noticed that something was very wrong about this creature. Its knees were bending backwards, like the legs of a of a llama or a horse. It didn't bend in the direction a human's knees bent. What am I looking at right now? What is this thing? When we return, the creature in the woods gets even closer. Stay tuned. Snap Judgment, where we're dancing in dark celebration for the launch of Season of the Wolf on our Supernatural Sister podcast, Spooked. When last we left, Nate was in the woods, terrified, hearing noises, and looking at a creature with glowing eyes. Snap Judgment. Something was very wrong about this creature. Its knees were bending backwards, like the legs of a, of a llama or a horse. It didn't bend in the direction a human's knees bent. What am I looking at right now? What is this thing? It creeped backwards like it was trying to be quiet. It got by behind the tree in a hurry and then squinted its eyes and I feel that heaviness come back over my eyelids. I reached back and tried to shake Keith's shoulder, but he was unconscious. His eyes are wide open, his mouth is hung open. That's when I was like, I'm on my own here. But now suddenly I hear a noise from another direction and it sounds like footsteps walking through the forest floor. 
The creature took its eyes off of me and looked over in that direction too. I'm looking and I'm wondering who's coming. Outside the light of the fire, I saw what looked like human footprints on the ground glowing. With each footfall, there were footprints illuminated on the ground, but there's no form making them. And as I'm hearing a step in the leaves, I see the illuminated footprint come forward. And as I hear the next step, the other foot came forward. Until it stepped into the area that was lit up by our fire. Now, the footprints cast a shadow on the ground. And I'm watching these shadowy little footprints walk right up to me. At this point, I don't know what I'm feeling. My whole take on reality is just disintegrating before my eyes. So I'm seeing these footprints walk up towards me, and then it felt like it walked right inside of me. I felt something change in my body as if something had just like kind of entered me and Suddenly, in a split second, I see all the bad things I'd ever done flash before my eyes. From the first time I lied to my parents, to acting up in school, just anything that I might have done that I knew wasn't right, I'm like seeing all this flash before my eyes. As soon as all that happened, suddenly, the fear left. I suddenly felt safe. As if something was with me that was going to protect me. Once I started to feel safe again, I looked back to where that creature had been. No sign of glowing eyes, no nothing. I looked back up in the trees where the fluttering of wings sound had come from. I looked around me on the ground. I don't know how I knew it, but I kind of knew the danger had passed. The sun was coming up. I was starting to hear the songs of birds singing in the forest. I actually remember pinching myself and being like, am I really awake now? Was that all a dream? What happened? I looked around to see if Keith was all right. He was about four feet further away, totally laid 100% flat on the ground sleeping. I heard Keith stirring and moving around and I said, hey Keith, you waking up? And he was like, yeah, yeah. Very calm, cool and collected like, yeah. I said, Keith, you have any idea what happened out here last night? Like, do you remember? Did you hear me when I was trying to shake you and say, hey, there's somebody over there? And he was like, no, no. What? Are you, who was here? He was asking me as if maybe somebody else that we knew came by that night or something. And I remember being a little hesitant to tell him what I'd seen. We got up and we walked out of the forest. And as we were walking out of the forest, I told him. He's just shaking his head like, you're crazy. You're crazy. You sure you weren't dreaming, kind of scoffing at the whole thing. I tried to talk about it, but it was too far of a stretch of reality for him to really be able to accept. And I soon learned that it's there's no point in trying to talk about this. after the event happened, like for the first six months, anytime I was in the woods, I was absolutely like hyper alert. I always found myself just saying, nope, that couldn't have been real. Nope, don't be so afraid because come on, how can that be real? Then one day I was visiting my friends, a married couple up in New Hampshire, This was a friend of mine and his wife. I was telling them the story. 
when I got to the part about saying that the creature's knees bent backwards and it appeared to have, like, the hind legs of a llama from the waist down, she let out a scream and said, oh, my God, I can't even believe this. She says, my uncle saw the same thing in Athol, Massachusetts, in 1968, in their backyard of their family home. This was at least 50 miles from where I saw this creature, and 20 years prior. When he saw it, it was on the tree line, peeking out through the trees, and when the thing saw him look at it, it sprang through the air back into the trees and was instantly just gone. When I heard that this woman's uncle had seen something with a similar body, I felt like I got a piece of my sanity back, and I felt like, ah, uh, vindicated. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I felt, I felt like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. I don't know what the footsteps were caused by, but I feel like if it wasn't for some other entity that was there protecting me that night, I don't think I would have woken up. I don't know if it was an ancestral spirit from way back in my family's history or if it was actually the spirit of that land protecting me. I don't know who or why. I just have a feeling that that's what keeps me safe in certain situations I've been in. Some of the handyman work I do is within five miles of where this happened. And it's in a very hilly, wooded area. I'm not so sure I won't see it again one day. But I don't think I'll have to fear it when I do. Thank you, Nate, for sharing your story with Spook. This piece is just a taste of the Spooked brand new season of The Wolf. Goes from now until All Hallows' Eve. Amazing journeys into the void. Available wherever you get your podcast, and I guarantee you are not going to want to turn out the lights. Spooked. What did, did I mention that the Spook podcast was fire? That original score for that story was by Doug Stewart. It was produced by Eric Yanez. Snap Judgment's Campfire Tales Season of the Wolf continues. We have a question. Have you ever heard of Buffer Night? Well, neither had we. Stay tuned. Snap Judgment, Campfire Tales, Season of the Wolf, featuring magical journeys from our evil twin podcast, Spooked. My name is from Washington. You've crossed over to Spook. <laughs> in an almost empty train station minding my own business and a man approaches me nondescript man the man I've never seen before and this man hands me a hundred dollar bill what? 
Sir, what's this? He's like, you look like a student who can use the money. And I'm not dressed like a vagabond or nothing. I'm freshly showered. No holes in my jeans. But here's the thing. I am a student. And right then, I could really, really, really use this money. Thank you? Sir, thank you very much. But he's already walking away. The train stops, not my train, and a woman emerges, walking a pot-bellied pig on a jeweled leash, looks at me like... This is the thing that everybody does, you know. Walking pigs in train stations. My train arrives next. I get on. At the other end of the train car, there's a guy about my age standing. He's holding on to two of the hanging circle things that you grab onto. I stand holding a hanging circle as well. He looks out of the window, looks at me, gives a wink, then does a backflip before resuming his gaze out of the window. And it's like, one of these things happening? Fine, that's life. Two? Okay. But three? In quick succession back to back? It's not crazy. I don't see anyone levitating, breathing fire, but... It feels off. Weird, like I'm being punked. Like, I've wandered into someone else's play. I don't know my lines. I don't know about you, but there have been several times when I've been in places and situations where for one reason or another, things just didn't smell right. Now, it's the summer of 1996, and 15-year-old Kyan lives in the middle of nowhere, Arkansas. He's too young to have a driver's license, but he's got something just as good. Friends named Paul and Taylor. Paul and Taylor can drive. Even better, they've got Taylor's mom's car for the weekend. Spooked. It's summer. Nobody cares where we go. There's no real expectations of you need to be home by this time because you've got school or anything like that or homework. And we decided, let's do something bigger than just go to the mall. There was a water park in southern Missouri. We left really early. Because it wasn't like just get on the highway and then get off at that exit. It was kind of off the main path a little bit. We hop in Paul's old Lincoln town car and we are headed out. The drive took around three hours. It was a fantastic day. It was sunny. It was beautiful. For Paul, it was definitely about the water slides. For Taylor and I, we were both very much like, there are girls everywhere. We're shooting our shots, like, hey, what's up? Do you go to school? What are you doing this summer? I was a little on the chubbier side, and so I I was less confident. So I was definitely not trying to show off, but Taylor was doing a full flip into the pool and things like that. Paul, he's like, come on, let's go, let's go. The slide is amazing. We gave up our pursuit of girls for a minute to go do that. And it was, it was a really fun slide. We're there all day. The sun was starting to go down. We were still juiced. I had three or four sodas and like a slushy. I was like on a sugar rush. I was ready to keep going, but the park's closing. On the way back, Taylor was driving. Paul's talking about the slides. We're talking about the girls. You know, how'd you see that one, you know, in the pink? Oh, my God. We're recounting our pervy teenage memories. 
so we're not focused on where our idiot driver is taking us. It's starting to get real dark. There's no trace of the sun anymore. Taylor's like, I'm pretty sure this is the turn. And we turn off, and there are some lights. But there's no more stores. There's no houses. This is like some county line road or something. He makes a turn, and then another turn. And now we're on dirt roads. The road is getting really, really bumpy. And in this bumpy, bouncy car, it's like we're riding bulls or something. And he's going way too fast. Finally, we're like, Taylor, where are we? What's the gas at, Taylor? We look over and it is just right on the E. We don't have enough to get back to even anywhere the last time we saw anything. So in our teenage brains, the only way is forward. We have to keep going because if we go back, we're gonna just run out of gas. At least this way we might have a shot. The first thing that we see that gives us a little bit of hope is a crossroad. And going across the road are power lines. Power lines got to feed something. Taylor's like, right or left? And Paul and I were both adamant, turn left. We thought left was the direction of home. Then, in the distance, one little dinky street light across the street from the light is a gas station a very old gas station. But they had pumps, they had lights on inside, and they had a crappy neon light that said open. We're like, yes, yes! That's what I'm talking about. We're all so excited. We're going to get gas, we're going to grab some snacks, we're going to figure out where we are, and we're going to go home. So we pull up, and it's one of those old kind of gas pumps where you pump and then you go inside and pay. Like, all right, Paul was going to pump the gas. Taylor and I were going to go inside and get directions and pay for the gas. So we walk over to the door to this place. I want to say there was some little wooden sign above the door giving it a name, but heck if I remember it. I see one or two overhead neon lights, kind of a dingy tile a few shelves that had like loaves of bread and motor oil and windshield wipers, gum. I know they had a boar's head, like a stuffed boar's head mounted on the wall. As we came in, there was a guy standing next to the counter, old guy, gray hair, wearing old dingy oversized jeans a ratty old button up he definitely didn't have all his teeth probably in his 60s or so and was just like well hello very animated guy and very comforting Taylor spoke first and he said we are lost we have a map could you show us where we're at and give us directions? It takes him a minute to figure out exactly where we are on this map. He's like, we're right here. And you're going to take this road. You're going to go straight here. And then you're going to see a sign for this road. And right here is where you're going to turn. Both Taylor and this old man are heads down looking at this map. I'm listening to him because I don't trust Taylor to nail this down. As soon as he's finished giving the directions, his body doesn't move, just his head looks up. His eyes are darting back and forth to both of us. And he's like, now y'all better make haste because tonight is buffer night. There's a stiffness to it, like warning somebody. 
Taylor and I just kind of looked at each other like, okay, we didn't, I wasn't exactly sure that's what I heard him say. My first thought was that I'd misheard him or that he had such a Southern patois that he was saying buffet, that they were going to buffet tonight. We need to get out of there because they were going to go eat at a buffet. I was like, he's going out to eat? And then a voice called out from another room, like a storeroom area or something. I could not hear what they said. But then he called out, yeah. And these two people come out, a man and a woman. They're like in their early 20s, maybe late teens. And they're standing right side by side, like shoulders touching. The girl's wearing a tank top and some old jeans. The guy's wearing some old jeans and he has this button-up style shirt. Very, like, out of date. And they look like they could be related. Like, they both have the same kind of dirty blonde hair. Their eyes are on me. They looked excited. Their grins were too big. Really, really happy almost giddy and then they look at the old man and they say are these our guests tonight I'm like God like what like what's going on and the old man shot him this look and it was like no these are some lost children every alarm in my head is just going off I've taken one step closer towards the door. The two people, they kind of looked at each other, and then the female, she was like, well, the three of you had better make haste because tonight's buffer night. She used the same words verbatim. She wasn't smiling anymore. Every single primal instinct in my body is saying, run. I'm shaking. What the is buffer night? At this point, Taylor's freaked out too. I'm like, let's get out of here. Let's go. Let's go, bud. Gas wasn't even a buck a gallon. We threw down a 20. We didn't wait for change. And I was like, thank you so much. And I'm pulling Taylor. Bolted out of there. We are scrambling. We're jumping in the car. It's Scooby-Doo. Paul has finished pumping the gas, and he's sitting in the back seat. He's like, what's going on? And we're just like, go, go, go. I barely got the door closed before we are airborne. Before we could even tell Paul what was going on, Paul was like, man, that was weird. And we were like, what do you mean? What happened? He was like, the whole time I was pumping gas, there were these three guys standing over there under the tree across the little road on the other side of the fence, just staring at me. I waved at him. I was like, hey, fellas, nothing. They didn't budge an inch. We're telling him like, do you know what buffer night means? He's like, buffer night? What is buffer night? I'm like, we don't know, but we have to get the hell out of there because tonight's buffer night, I guess. And then Taylor says, what if these are bad directions? What if this is where they want us to go? And we're like, well, the other way is nothing. Once we've made the second turn, we're on an actual highway with double yellow lines and we see a sign and we're like, yep, this is right. And we're just, it's just this like, (sighs) we're talking about what all this could be and we are going dark. Our minds are in terrible places. I'm landing on a situation where we're on the menu, either some type of cannibal thing, or we're going to be tied up in some back room with people doing whatever they feel like to us. And then that will be the story. 
Kine and the guys went to the water park and were never seen or heard from again. We get back to the house and we are going to the bathroom for the first time because we've been too scared to stop. Taylor put on some TV to kind of give us something else to look at and think about, but I don't think any of us were really watching it. Taylor and I kept trying to figure it out. Paul didn't want to talk about it. Like, let's just not ever think about it again. A few days later, I always had to mow my great-grandmother's yard, and I called her Mama. And I had just come inside for something to drink, and it hit me. Ask Mama. And I said, Mama, I was up in Missouri last week, and I ran into somebody, and they said that tonight was buffer night. She just kind of stood, like, stared blankly at me. I'm like, do you have any idea what that is? And she says, buffer night? No idea. I asked some of her friends. I asked my grandfather, people that had lived in northwest Arkansas and the surrounding areas their whole lives, they ever heard of that. And nobody would ever heard of anything like that. I'm telling the story in college to a group of friends, and a couple of them got really into it. They were like, that can't be that far from here. A few times on the weekends, we'd go out for drives, like, let's head out to where we think this might be. Let's try to retrace the steps. Nothing looks familiar. There'd been so much development through there that we just couldn't find anything. When you're watching a scary movie, you see a character do something, and you're like, no one in their right mind would do something like that. Paul, Taylor, and I, we survived that scary movie. We were the guys that showed up at the beginning, before the kids that get slaughtered. We saw the signs. We read the room. We were the guys that got away. We took off. We escaped Buffer Night. If you know anything about Buffer Night, please let me know. and Bond for sharing this story. If you know what's up with Buffer Night, drop us a line. We'll make sure Cayenne gets it. The original score for that story is by Dirk Schwartzhoff. It was produced by Ann Ford. Know that this is but one turn of the screw. If you dig it, the Spook Supernatural Mystical Magical Podcast is available everywhere right now. New worlds, new stories, new creatures, spooked season of the wolf. We can't wait for you to take that spook step into the spook void. We hear this blood curdling scream followed by the deepest howl you have ever heard. The bed shakes gently at first. And then it started shaking violently. We both jumped off the bed. Suddenly, there was lightning. We turned and we looked towards the window. There was this black shadow on my window. And then, all of a sudden, her body, the face changes, the voice changes, like a man, she talks with a lot of vigor, she's possessed. My people, sons, daughters, I'm here. 
There's a brand new, never before heard spook story waiting for you on the spook podcast right this very minute. You are welcome. Spooked was brought to you by the team that would turn the car around immediately. The slightest mention of anything called buffer night. Except for Mark Ristich. He's the guy at the movie who wants to discover where this red fluid behind the scary door is coming from. There's Davy Kim, Zoe Frigno, Ann Ford, Eric Gagnez, Taylor Ducat, Marissa Dodge, Miles Lassie, Doug Stewart, Paulina Creaky, Elizabeth Z. Pardue, Aditya Matu, and Lulu Jemima. This book theme song is by Pat Masidi Miller. My name is in Washington. And do whatever you must. But you can't sneak up on me because I will never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, never turn out the light.